Thank you, John. Um, the uh, title change reflects the emphasis of the talk. Uh, the original title uh, had um, information content of a photon in it. We will get to that at the end of the talk, but uh, we'll have much more focus on the process of how we got there, which involves radiance and its application in many different branches of imaging, in, in imaging with rays, with geometrical optics, with physical optics, even in quantum optics, and in the field that Kyle and I both work in, uh, radiological imaging. Um, you'll also notice that we've added a co-author, Luca Cauchi. This is going to be a talk about connection, the cosine of the angle between the surface normal and the flux direction. So it's the dot product of n hat and s hat. So that cosine in the first equation can be associated with either the uh, area or the solid angle omega. So uh, that means I can uh, define the area times the cosine as a projected area, that is to say projected onto the flux direction, or I can talk about a projected solid angle. The notation here is from Palmer and Grant, where capital omega is a projected solid angle and little omega is a, um, an ordinary solid angle. So what you see from the first expression on the right at the bottom is that the uh, L depends really on the projected area, and the important point is that does not change as you tilt the plane. So even though it's defined with a reference plane in mind, it does not depend on the orientation of the reference plane. Uh, now, once you know the radiance, a lot of other radiant, radiometric quantities are easily derived. The irradiance is specified as a function, lowercase r, on the plane P. So it's really defined in three dimensions as well. Unlike radiance, however, the irradiance does change if you change the orientation of the plane. And here are the integral expressions for getting to the irradiance, the watts per square meter from the radiance. Textbook ex expressions, next. Uh, radiant intensity is similar. It gives the um, uh, radiant intensity per unit actual solid angle, not projected angle, and total flux is given by the doubled integral given here. Uh, uh, students often make mistakes by saying that flux is LA omega. That is almost never true, except in simple textbook problems. Next. Uh, the next quantity I want to introduce is the spectral radiance, uh, specifying not only the dependence of the uh, radiant flux on position and direction of the flux, but also on the wavelength. So that's defined differentially here on the top equation. So if we specify the wavelength in nanometers, then the units of spectral radiance are watts per square meter per sphere radian per nanometer. We could equally use a frequency axis for the spectrum, in which case we get a hertz in the units, or uh, this calligraphic E is the photon energy, so I can express r spectral radiance as watts per square meter per sphere radian per electron volt. So it's our arbitrary choices for the spectral axis. Next. Uh, now, another uh, wrinkle on the definition of radiance is that we don't have to express the flux in the traditional units of uh, watts or joules per second. If we're using the spectral radiances and we are talking about one wavelength or one photon energy at a time, and so we can easily convert watts to uh, um, photons per second, leading to the quantity uh, of uh, spectral radiance, spectral photon radiance, which is a spectral radiance per re-expressed in photons per second rather than in, uh, in watts per second, or watts or joules per second. 
okay, that was all really textbook <coughs> material. Uh, let's go on to something that's a, a little less elementary. How do we define radiance in physical optics? Well, that question was answered by Adrian Walther in 1968. Uh, Amo Wolf uh, contributed greatly to this area as well. Um, so uh, Walther's expression is shown here. It expresses <coughs> the uh, radiance, spectral radiance per unit frequency in particular. Um, at a point defined by this two-dimensional vector r on a plane p, so in fact still expressed at a general point in 3D. Cosine theta is the same n hat dot s hat as we've been using. And now we see an integral which involves the scalar electric field, perhaps just one component of the electric field vector classically. And you see it's a quadratic functional of the field. It's the field shifted uh, by plus a half r prime and minus a half r prime, and then multiplied by what's really a Fourier kernel and integrated over the plane p. Uh, the angle brackets here denote a statistical average over an ensemble of scalar fields, um, and this s hat or this s perp is the direction cosines of the vector s in the plane P. So it's the uh, vector S hat uh, projected onto the plane P. Um, now the expectation that you see here in coherence theory is called the mutual intensity. It's really just a special case of the mutual coherence function. So in words, what this equation says, what Walther's definition says is that the generalized spectral radiance is the 2D Fourier transform of the mutual intensity, where the Fourier vector um, is just 2 pi over lambda uh, times this uh, vector of direction cosine. So different uh, propagation directions for the field correspond to uh, different spatial frequencies conjugate to R prime. Um, Another definition uh, uh, given by Walther uh, is in another connection between this expression and Walther's expression is that the integral is a Wigner distribution function, which is something that originated in quantum mechanics, but is now a key tool in the field of phase space optics, as discussed in the recent book by Marcus Testorf and um, uh, Jorge Ojeda Castaneda and others. Um, now look at the expression at the top, and if we modify it ever so slightly, we get a quantum mechanical generalization of Walther's radiance. The modifications are to replace the two scalar fields that appear on the top with two electric field operators, which are standard tools in the quantum optics world, and to reinterpret the angle brackets as a quantum mechanical expectation. So we have a very nice parallel um, uh, pair of formulas given the uh, radiance in physical optics and quantum optics. Uh, so back up one, one more. Uh, so here's an example of a quantum imaging system that would use the second formula. Uh, the source of entangled photons on the left might be uh, a uh, a source of a spontaneous parametric down conversion. It might also be in the radiology world just the uh, entangled gamma rays that are produced in positron annihilation in PET imaging. Uh, and you get pairs of events, in the, of highly correlated events in the two channels in either case. Now let's talk about transport and conservation of radiance. In the Written version of this paper, we uh, go through this in some detail, starting with the Boltzmann transport equation, which is a, an equation of motion for the spectral photon radiance. And we derive some of these results, but I'll just present them here. If I have a volumetric source of radiation, 
then the radiance at the indicated ray is just determined by the integral along the line defined by that ray. So I can pick uh, three different points specified by R1, R2, and R3 in free space, and uh, they define three points along the same ray. The ray direction uh, is uh, S hat again, and that is the flux direction, and the uh, conservation formula that you get from the Boltzmann transport equation is that the radiance at point R1 in direction S hat is equal to the radiance at point R2 and also S hat, and that's the same as in point R3 and the same S hat. Radiance is constant along a ray in free space, but it's more general than that. Back up one, please, yes. It works also for lossless optical systems of any kind. If there are no reflection losses or absorption losses, I can trace rays through any system and define multiple points. Uh, because it's the same ray, uh, I can relate S1 uh, to S2 to S3. They're not the same vector any longer, but the equation is that uh, L of R1 and S1 hat divided by the square of the refractive index um, is the same as at the other two points given. So if the uh, observation points are all in the same medium, then once again you say that radiance is constant along a ray. Okay. Now it's interesting to do this with uh, ABC mat matrices in lossless paraxial imaging systems. Uh, first, geometrically, you're all familiar with the ABCD concept where the, um, the ray height and the angle with respect to the optical axis is related this way by a two by two matrix. Uh, this is for systems with rotational symmetry, um, but it works equally well with non-rotational symmetry. Um, and now we have the quantities uh, two-dimensional r and the two-dimensional vector direction cosines uh, forming what amounts to a four by one vector. And now the a, b, c, and d are bold. So each component of the a, b, c, d matrix uh, it's, is itself a two by two matrix. The overall transfer, transfer is a four by four matrix. Uh, and the conservation of radiance looks like this. I just rewrite the radiance function as a function of these same four components, but written as a four by one vector. And all I have to do is to insert the, um, the matrix operator uh, in um, M into the radiance in one plane, and then another parallel plane uh, will have the, the radiance on the left. Uh, now, remarkably, um, this expression holds for Walther's radiance as well as geometrical uh, um, radiance. Uh, so in paraxial imaging systems, uh, the physical optics radiance is constant along the ray defined by geometrical optics. And in fact, that will be true in the quantum optical case as well. Okay, now the topic of radiance detectors. We we're used to thinking about detectors as either thermal detectors or, or photon detectors, so let's not talk about thermal detectors. All so-called photon detectors really respond in some way quite specifically to spectral photon radiance, that one particular radiance quantity, uh, uh, radiance in, uh, flux in photons per second and as a function of wavelength. So uh, we distinguish four different classes of detectors depending on what information they yield or record about the spectral photon radiance function. There are familiar integrating detectors like DSLR and uh, uh, 
cell phone cameras. There are um, pixelated photon counting detectors, which I'll describe uh, uh, soon. They're of great interest in computer tomography these days. Uh, there are position sensitive detectors and then the new class, which we'll get to called photon processing detectors. So if you're designing a CCD or CMOS camera, you're gonna work very hard to make it respond linearly over you know, typically six or seven uh, orders of magnitude of the incident exposure. If you succeed in doing that, then the average output at any one pixel necessarily has this form. And it's mathematically required to have this form. It's an integral over the area of a detector, uh, over the area of a detector element, basically, over the um, photon energy, and over a hemisphere of directions of the projected solid angle, and over time if the spectral photon radiance is varying with time. The coefficient uh, given here is a generalized quantum efficiency, usual quantum efficiency for pixel M, but it, one that can depend on R, S hat, and uh, E. Uh, next. Um, now, that's the expression you use if you know the spectral photon radiance right in the plane of the sensor. Your reference plane P is taken as the sensor plane. Um, but you've got a lot of flexibility in where you take that plane because we know from the earlier discussion that it's easy to get the radiation from one plane to another, at least in lossless imaging systems. It's just a matter of ray tracing. So if uh, you uh, want to know uh, what the radiance is at one point uh, from radiance at another, you just trace the appropriate uh, rays between the two, and they are numerically equal. No transforms or corrections or anything are required. So consider some other plane P. You'll notice that the first integral on the right is now over plane P rather than rather than uh, the, the detector plane. And you'll notice that it's no longer just a simple quantum efficiency, but it's this rather complicated response function D sub M, which depends on all of these uh, variables. That D sub M accounts not only for the response of the detector, but also to any um, optical elements that we place between this new reference plane P and the detector. Uh, so one way to summarize this equation is to say that each mean pixel is a linear functional of the radiance in the plane P, where the optical elements that we stick between the reference plane P and the detector give us enormous freedom in just how we construct that, uh, that weighting function. Um, and and you get a different weighting function for each pixel. And these days, uh, even cell phones can have as many as 50 million pixels. Um, people always ask, why do you need a 50 megapixel cell phone? And this is why, because you can measure 50 million separate linear functionals of the radiance, one for each pixel. And a good example of how you can take advantage of that is with the light field cameras that are coming out as novelty items now where you can refocus a, an image or change the depth of field after you've recorded it. And you can do that because you've incorporated a, a uh, lens lit array um, into the system as shown here. The object is imaged onto the lens lit array and then the lens lit elements uh, image the exit pupil of the objective lens onto the photosensor array. Pixelated photon counting detectors are pretty easy. The basic idea is that you include in, uh, in the pixel design uh, circuitry for sensing the presence of a single absorbed and detected optical photon and keeping track of the number at each, uh, at each element. 
uh, so sometime later you read it out and the answer is the uh, number of photons that have uh, occurred uh, during the exposure period. Now as a practical matter, the, a difficulty in doing that is that you can also get counts from dark current. So you get around that by including some sort of optical gain mechanism in the photon counting detector. Common gain mechanism include just ordinary optical image intensifiers like microchannel plates, um, avalanche photodiodes, electron multiplied CCDs. Um, and in the X-ray and gamma ray world, uh, scintillators or semiconductor detectors where you get a lot of charge carriers or optical photons for each individual high energy uh, photon. Uh, now this is the concept of photon sensitive uh, gamma rays, Hamamatsu makes them a, a line of these things, for example. You have a beam of light coming in and uh, it introduces the charge carriers in a silicon detector. You have four separate readout electrons, electrodes. You do some simple arithmetic and you estimate the position. Now, the primary application, as I've just described it, is for tracking a beam or a localized spot of light. But if you add a gain mechanism in this case, then a single absorbed photon, let's say in the photocathode of an image intensifier, produces a lot of light and, and you can track the position of that a single absorbed photon because it now makes signals on, and potentially very strong signals, on each of the four electrodes. Um, so the XY coordinates of an individual uh, optical photon can be recorded at very low light level with a device like this. Um, and you'll notice there are no pixels. We, uh, on this slide, dispensed with pixels. Instead, the output is the coordinates, XY coordinates of that uh, photon absorption event. And the output data is just a list of those coordinates. We call that list mode storage. It's very important in a lot of medical applications. Uh, no pixels in this case. You don't have to have pixels to make a continuous optical detector. And we can uh, push that idea still further by the photon processing detectors, which look something like this. You have an incoming uh, photon, you have an image intensifier, um, an output phosphor, and now you have a whole series of uh, photo detectors which respond rapidly um, and produce a pulse for each absorbed uh, event. Uh, next, please. Um, and then you have a processor that estimates not only position, as in the previous slide, but uh, energy, even direction, uh, other attributes of the incoming photon. And those estimates are the image data that are stored as a list of measured attributes. Attributes are properties of the photon absorption event. Once again, no pixels. These are continuous devices. Um, okay, so let's talk about the uh, properties of the data from photon processing detectors. Well, if you estimate K uh, parameters, um, um, with K being, well, then the, each list entry is a K-dimensional vector. So for example, you might image the 3D location of an absorption event in some detector material, a direction, and uh, an energy. So that's six parameters you would uh, estimate. Uh, and yes, in practice, you store them in a list. But a mathematically equivalent way to go is to make a point process, which just means a sum of delta functions as defined here. You have 3D delta functions for the position, you have angular delta functions, you have an energy delta function. The tilde uh, indicates the estimate process. J is the number of events, which is a random variable. You don't control that. 
Um, and it's in practice a Poisson random variable. So you uh, have a Poisson random process. The mean of this Poisson random process in an imaging context is uh, dependent on the object being imaged, which is F. So you denote it as U bar of a given F. Next. Now, uh, in a paper uh, that Luca Tucci and I wrote uh, a couple of years ago, we showed that this, uh, maybe surprisingly, this mean depends linearly on F. Uh, there's a, an operator, which is a continuous to continuous operator in the terminology that Kyle and I used in our book. Um, uh, and uh, it, it's an operator that maps the three-dimensional characteristics of F to, in our example, a six-dimensional function. It maps a continuous, a function of continuous variables to a function of more continuous variables. By contrast, uh, the uh, most common description for digital imaging systems, most correct one in most cases, is G bar mean data is HF, where now H is a continuous to discrete operator. The, a crucial difference is that continuous to discrete operators necessarily have null functions. That's not the case with this new operator L. So this is a fundamentally new operator uh, for image science and maybe other applications. Uh, now, one thing you know about Poisson statistics is that the entire probability law, any statistical moment you want, is determined by the mean. The same thing is true of a Poisson random process, but now the mean is a function, and the probability law is a probability density function. So I can get a 60-point spread function simply by renormalizing this mean uh, LF, and because the events are statistically independent, under the Poisson assumption, the overall PDF can be expressed as a product of these uh, 60 uh, PSFs. Now let's relate this to image quality. In the world, uh, world that Kyle, Kyle and I work in, uh, we defined image, imaging in terms of ability to extract medically useful information or scientifically useful information to, to perform some specific task. Um, and the ability to perform that task is limited by the randomness in the data. So far, we've talked about randomness arising from the photon noise, but there's also an inevitable statistical variability in the objects being imaged. So to account for that, we define a probability on the data given a class of objects which is really just the probability of the data given a particular object averaged over all objects in the class. Uh, to do this operationally, um, we can approximate the probability of the data given the class by a sample mean of probability objects given, probability of the data given a particular object. Uh, and this is very useful if we could have programs to accurately simulate the objects. Uh, in Kyle's group, uh, they perform virtual clinical trials based on um, accurate, very accurate simulations of the human breast, for example. Next. So just to indicate pictorially what's going on here, um, here's what the class probabilities look like for three different total number of events. On the lower left, we have a large number of events, and we just have a superposition of these conditional probabilities that we're talking about. And this is, of course, a cartoon two-dimensional representation of what's really a very large dimensional data set. But as I go across left to right, I reduce the number of events, for example, by reducing the exposure time and the um, uh, contribution of the Poisson noise increases and the overall probabilities uh, 
spreads out into a cloud here. And if I want to discriminate between two different classes of objects, I just do the same thing for each class. And once again, I see that there's a high separability of the events um, uh, for a large number, uh, a separability of the classes for a large number of events. But then if I have a smaller number of events, the separability decreases. So I can use this approach to discuss the uh, class separability as a function of the number of events here, but more interestingly as a function of the type of detector and processing the configuration of the imaging system or the task uh, uh, of interest to the, to the clinician. That's a virtual clinical trial. Next. Okay, future directions. <coughs> Where do we go with this? Uh, I would like to see photon processing detectors implemented and used in many types of practical optical uh, imaging systems and maybe other optical engineering applications. Um, uh, as a mathematician, I'm more interested in the understanding of the operator L and under what circumstances it has null functions, what the implications are for task performance. Uh, I believe that uh, true uh, super resolution can be achieved with photon processing and I'm going to try hard to demonstrate that in the lab. And uh, finally, I would like to see the engineering community incorporate some of these ideas into ray trace programs, which I think of as radiance transport codes. Thank you very much. <laughs>